The development of electromagnetic catapults on China's Fujian aircraft carrier began in 2001, which drew experience from the Shanghai Maglev train project at the time. Land-based testing of the electromagnetic catapult for this Type 003 aircraft carrier can be traced back to 16 years ago. China has kept quiet about it, but satellite images from Western companies unveil the truth. In June 2008, while China's first aircraft carrier was still undergoing modifications, a test site for electromagnetic catapults appeared on the left bank of the Huangpu River in southern Shanghai. These are early satellite photos of the Shanghai test site. You can see blue powder scattered on the water surface. As the object being pushed fell into the water, the blue powder splashes onto the ground outside the walls. Some say this was to test the effects of falling into the water, while others say it was to prevent onlookers from approaching the test site, as no one wants to get dirty with the blue powder all over their clothes. These actions reveal that in the first decade of the 21st century, land-based testing of electromagnetic catapults were being secretly conducted in China. In 2009, near Huangdi village in the northern part of Bohai Sea, a training base for naval aviation was established. After 2011, small red cars appeared here, almost identical to those used for static load testing of catapults on the Fujian aircraft carrier. In 2015, both steam catapults and electromagnetic catapults appeared at this base, with a shorter one being the electromagnetic catapult. By the second half of 2017, various types of payloads often appeared on the catapult track, signaling a new phase in land-based catapult testing. Pro-CCP military bloggers claim that after over a decade of intensive research and countless land tests, the dead load test of the Type 003 aircraft carrier cannot fail. However, it's surprising that China's government media, CCTV, didn't make a special report or take photos of this claimed world's most advanced electromagnetic catapult system. Instead, news came out using photos taken by people on airplanes and some footage from U.S. aircraft carrier catapult tests. People who watched the videos commented that there was no footage of the actual catapult process, just splashes of water. Indeed, the video only captured smaller and irregular splashes of water, unlike the larger water column seen during the static load tests of the U.S. Kennedy IV-class aircraft carrier. People also pointed out the similarity between the color and shape of the cars on the aircraft carrier and that of the U.S. This is a U.S. Newport News shipbuilding, where a 36-ton test vehicle on the Kennedy carrier is accelerated by the electromagnetic catapult, reaching speeds of over 150 miles per hour in just two seconds and flying over 300 feet before plunging into the water, creating water columns over 10 meters high, vertically and fully formed. Analysts point out that the difference in the water splashes indicates that the U.S. electromagnetic catapult system provides more powerful and concentrated thrust, and its test vehicle maintains a more stable posture during the catapult process. The crooked water column when the Type 003 carrier's test vehicle hits the water may reflect uneven thrust distribution, causing the test vehicle to deviate or oscillate. Currently, various models of carrier aircraft such as the J-35, J-15, and the KJ-600 have been repeatedly conducting compatibility tests on China's Type 003 carrier. Safety equipment, such as life rafts, has also been installed. The next step is expected to be aircraft catapult takeoff tests. It is reported that since the second half of 2016, extensive land-based testing of the electromagnetic catapult has been conducted at the aircraft carrier test and training base near the Bohai Sea, accumulating extensive data. There are only a limited number of images showing aircraft stationed on the catapult track, and no video footage is available at all implying that the Chinese authorities are controlling the release of related information. Many people are dissatisfied with the military's secrecy. While the four class carriers have already been deployed, the fate of the Fujian carrier is still being experimented. If the electromagnetic catapult technology of the Type 003 carrier is truly advanced, people question why not present actual takeoff videos and photos to prove it. There are rumors that many mishaps occurred during the testing process, such as several J-15 prototypes being badly damaged, with even their tires stripped bare. Some people sarcastically remark that let's see if the carrier can actually take off, as the duration and intensity of the electromagnetic catapult are uncertain. Some others use historical failures to poke at the sore spots of the Chinese Navy, drawing parallels between the Shandong carrier and the catastrophic defeat of the Beiyang fleet at the Battle of Liu Gong Island, 
or comparing Fujian carrier and the downfall of the Nanyang fleet at the Battle of Fuzhou. Faced with these doubts, some Chinese military bloggers have come forward to defend the CCP. They assert that the Fujian carrier is indeed powerful and will rapidly become combat ready, unlike the US 4 class carrier, which has issues even after deployment. One blogger quoted a satellite image from an American expert who subsequently clarified. He said that conducting catapult tests on aircraft carriers is much more complex than on land. During land tests, there is sufficient power supply, stable climate, and ample operating space, especially that there are only single catapults in operation each time. However, it is entirely different on aircraft carriers. If other systems cannot coordinate, the catapults may malfunction, or if one system has a problem and isn't repaired promptly, it may indirectly affect the electromagnetic catapult system. Most of the issues encountered by the US war class carrier fall into these categories. Furthermore, the expert pointed out that even during static load tests of the electromagnetic catapult on the Type 003 carrier, the carrier's own power system is not used. Instead, it relies on shore-based power. He emphasized that an aircraft carrier is one of the most complex engineering systems in the world, and integrating various subsystems has always been a major engineering challenge. The Type 003 carrier is China's largest and most complex warship. If someone believes that the Fujian carrier can be ready for combat quickly, it can only be said that they have no engineering experience. The Fujian carrier has three catapults and uses distributed energy storage. If one fails, the others can continue working. However, people reveal that the power system of the Type 3 carrier has not been properly isolated, and if a problem occurs, the entire system may be affected. The deceleration of the arresting gear on the Type 3 carrier is controlled by hydraulic damping turbines. Following the same logic as the Americans, China switched from hydraulic turbines to electromagnetic turbines, resulting in a wider range of arresting gear damping and faster damping adjustment. People are concerned about whether the flight deck of the Type 3 aircraft carrier can withstand hard landings of aircrafts. They say that modern aircraft carriers' flight decks are filled with high-tech equipment and complex structures. If aircrafts make hard landings, even the 30 millimeter thick deck and catapult track could deform, making it difficult for aircrafts to take off again. In World War II, if an aircraft carrier's deck was bombed, it was simple enough to nail down some wooden planks and continue using it. But it's not that easy now. Even if the surface looks perfectly repaired, internal structural damage may prevent the deck from bearing the weight and speed of modern carrier-based aircraft. Moreover, if a fire breaks out, the steel plates and underlying structures are essentially destroyed. Because in a big fire, the hardness and toughness of those steel plates will decrease, and they will need to undergo major repairs. For China, there is little experience in this area. If the Type 3 deck is indeed damaged, repairing it will be a challenge. Currently, the electromagnetic catapult of the Type 3 aircraft carrier is still under testing, partly because some systems are more complex than those of the United States. The United States uses a linear synchronous motor, LSM, with electromagnetic coils laid under the track and rare earth permanent magnetic installed on the catapult car. When the electromagnetic coils are connected to the electrical power, the magnetic fields generate thrust. This technology has strong magnetic force, high thrust, light weight, and does not generate heat. Although China has many rare earth metals, its technology is still somewhat lacking and constrained by Europe and the United States. So, China first learned the basic moves of the linear synchronous motor from the Shanghai Maglev project and then chose a different path, opting for the linear induction motor. The goal is not to rely on foreign rare earth magnetic materials. The principle of the LIM is not difficult to understand. There is a long aluminum plate below the battery catapult track with a series of primary coils underneath. These coils are energized in a specific sequence and frequency causing a continuously advancing magnetic field to appear above the conductor plate. This magnetic field interacts with the coils on the catapult, generating thrust along the track. By controlling the current magnitude, direction, and frequency through the primary coils, the intensity and movement speed of the electromagnetic field generated on the conductor plate can be indirectly controlled. The control theory of LIM sounds relatively straightforward, but its practical application and debugging are not as simple as that of the linear synchronous motor. This is because the interaction between the induced magnetic field on the conductor plate and the primary magnetic field is very complex. Theoretically, it must first be predicted correctly to know how to control it. So the design and debugging requirements for the control system are relatively high. In addition, the induced current in the aluminum conductor plate will generate heat, 
so overheating is a problem. Otherwise, it will affect the performance and stability of the system. Finally, the design of the control strategy, conductor plate, and coils need to be optimized. But even if the optimal configuration is found, a large number of experiments and tests are still required. The above only discusses the track part of the electromagnetic catapult. In terms of energy storage, China also has issues. The catapult system needs to release 40 kilowatt hour of electricity in two seconds, with an instantaneous power exceeding 70,000 kilowatts to catapult aircraft to a speed of 300 kilometers per hour. Ordinary power grids and batteries are incapable of this. Currently, available energy storage technologies mainly include flywheel and supercapacitor energy storage. The electromagnetic catapult system used by the United States primarily relies on flywheel energy storage, supplemented by supercapacitors. Flywheel energy storage is like a high-speed spinning top that can store a large amount of kinetic energy. When energy needs to be released, the flywheel slows down, converting kinetic energy into electrical energy. China's electromagnetic catapult system also utilizes flywheel energy storage, but differs in power supply. China uses medium voltage direct current to power the storage system, while the United States uses alternating current. When using medium voltage direct current, different flywheels can have different speeds as long as the output voltage is consistent, which greatly simplifies the design and control. However, this also brings significant problems as it requires high power direct current circuit breakers, which is still an immature technology. If a short circuit occurs, the powerful electric arc will be difficult to extinguish and pose a safety threat. There are many international discussions regarding these issues. While China claims with full confidence that we have already solved it without providing specific details on how it was solved. When China promotes its electromagnetic catapult, it only emphasizes that it is different from the United States. It highlights the use of medium voltage direct current, but does not clearly point out that it also uses flywheel energy storage like the United States nor does it explicitly mention the potential safety issues associated. Listening to these selective statements makes some Chinese speculate whether the Type 3 aircraft carrier uses supercapacitor as well. The technology behind electromagnetic catapults is indeed ironic. As a rare earth resource country, China avoids using rare earth materials because they have trouble with actual production. They ultimately choose a solution with greater system testing difficulty. Although they clearly simplify the flywheel energy storage system using medium voltage direct current, they don't admit that they use flywheel energy storage technology like the US, nor do they mention their efforts to reduce technical difficulty. Conversely, Chinese media point out various problems encountered by the US Ford class carriers when using flywheel energy storage. But in fact, the US Navy has successfully solved these problems long ago. According to official data, as of early January this year, the four-class carrier has been performing maritime missions for 244 days. At the end of June 2022, the four-class carrier announced that it had achieved 10,000 launches and landings. In the summer of 2023, the U.S. Navy also signed a contract with General Atomics to provide electromagnetic catapult systems for USS Doris Miller Carrier and the future French aircraft carrier indicating that U.S. electromagnetic catapult technology is maturing. China claims its flywheel energy storage's peak output power is twice that of the U.S. However, industry experts point out that this may only be based on certain experimental data or design indicators. In actual engineering applications, simply comparing peak power is meaningless. It must be measured against whether it benefits the entire project. China has not yet launched its own aircraft, but there has been plenty of media promotion and exaggeration. While the four-class carrier has already achieved full combat capability, Chinese media still dwell on its early problems. There are many comments online that despite boasting high power output, why can't the Type 003 aircraft carrier launch the Y-20 transport aircraft and the Yu-20 tanker? From the start of construction to static load testing, the U.S. Ford class carrier took 5.5 years, while China's Fujian carrier took 6.5 years. From dead load testing in 2015 to achieving full combat capability in 2022, the four-class carrier took seven years. Static load testing to deployment took two years, and from deployment to achieving initial operational capability in early 2020 took three years. Finally, in March 2022, the USS Ford held its first joint military exercise with the Italian aircraft carrier Cavour, marking its attainment of full combat capability. 
It took another two years to finally resolve all issues. Last summer, the electromagnetic launch system on this carrier finally matured and could be transferred for use by the future French aircraft carrier. China falls far behind the United States in this area. The challenges during the development of the Fujian carrier will likely be greater and more complex. Referencing the Ford class carrier, if the Fujian carrier launched in June 2022, wants to achieve full combat capability, it may have to wait until 2029 or even 2030. Its next major event will be sea trials, but it must first pass two hurdles, mooring tests at port and tests at sea by the manufacturer. Mooring tests assess the functionality of equipment and machinery already installed on the vessel while it is anchored at port. Next is a factory sea test, where the ship goes to sea under the manufacturer's guidance to ensure overall performance meets standards, and major functional modules such as hull, power, and navigation are problem-free. Finally, military sea trials involve comprehensive testing, focusing on the carrier's basic performance, mechanical operations, communication, detection and weapon systems, power and navigation performance, and most importantly, aviation systems. This includes testing key technologies such as electromagnetic catapults, and arrests, aircraft refueling, and ammunition handling directly related to the carrier's core combat capability. Although the electromagnetic catapult system has been extensively tested on land, deploying it on a carrier at sea is another matter. It involves not only individual system testing, but also inter-system tests to ensure all components work together, especially regarding aircraft takeoff and landing. When the Fujian carrier will begin sea trials depends on when the flight deck lines, parking positions, and movement paths are drawn. These markings are used to guide flight operations, so once they are made, sea trials are imminent. As the first truly domestically produced aircraft carrier, the Fujian carrier should follow the example of the US 4 class carrier in promptly identifying and resolving issues. After all, solving issues during peacetime reduces the chances of being caught by enemies. However, there is a fundamental difference in the political systems of China and the United States. It may be difficult for the outside world to know about the problems encountered by the Fujian carrier during sea trials and deployment. People only hear from the Chinese media that China is always leading in ahead. Last summer, when the 003 aircraft carrier was just launched, they claimed it could outperform the long-serving Ford class carrier. Right after it just completed static load testing, China claims it has already surpassed a four-class carrier that has been in service for 244 days.